We are continuing our studies in the Gospel of Mark, and we're going to finish up chapter 7 this morning, beginning with verse 24 through verse 37. Jesus has been having a discussion with the scribes and the Pharisees, and now we read in verse 24, Jesus got up and went away from there to the region of Tyre. And when he had entered a house, he wanted no one to know of it, yet he could not escape notice. But after hearing of him, a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately came and fell at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of, Syra, of the Syrophoenician race, and she kept asking him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he was saying to her, let the children be satisfied first, for it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she answered and said to him, yes, Lord, but even the dogs under the table feed on the children's crumbs. And he said to her, because of this answer, go, the demon has gone out of your daughter. And going back to her home, she found the child lying on the bed, the demon having left. Again, he went out from the region of Tyre and came through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee within the region of Decapolis. They brought to him one who was deaf and spoke with difficulty, and they implored him to lay his hand on him. Jesus took him aside from the crowd by himself and put his fingers into his ears. And after spitting, he touched the tongue with the saliva. And looking up to heaven with a deep sigh, he said to him, Ephatha, that is, be opened. And his ears were opened and the impediment of his tongue was removed and he began speaking plainly. And he gave them orders not to tell anyone, but the more he ordered them, the more widely they continued to proclaim it. They were utterly astonished, saying, He does all things well. He makes even the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and bless our time of study in it together. Let's bow together in a word of prayer. In John chapter 10, Jesus speaks of himself as the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. Israel is his flock, his fold. But he adds, I have other sheep which are not of this fold. I must bring them also. He will bring them in different ways, but always in the right way. He does all things well. That's the confession at the end of our passage in Mark chapter 7, which is about the shepherd finding other sheep, not of Israel's fold, when he left Galilee to travel among the Gentiles bringing mercy. He encounters two people. Both are tormented, cruelly afflicted, a mother because of her daughter's demon and a man because of his deafness. But the Lord finds them and saves them. And that too is the lesson of our passage. The trials that crush are also what lead to healing and blessing. Would these two have known Christ apart from their trials? In a very real sense, what broke them brought them to Christ, and he received them. Jesus has just finished a conversation with the scribes and Pharisees who accused his disciples of violating the traditions of the elders by not washing their hands before eating. They were worried about ceremonial cleanness, which they thought cleansed the soul. Jesus corrected them. It's not what goes into a person that defiles, but what comes out of him. Following that, Mark writes that Jesus left Galilee and went to the region of Tyre. Now that's interesting, because that was a Gentile region. And nothing was more unclean to a Pharisee than a Gentile. 
They call Gentiles dogs, unclean animals. But the Lord had said, it's not dirt or diet that makes a person unclean spiritually. It's the heart that poisons a person. It's a new heart that people need, not clean hands. And it's hard to imagine an, a clearer object lesson for that statement than what follows. Because it is there among the Gentiles that the disciples get an example of the very thing the Lord was talking about, an example of vital faith and a right heart. Tyre was an ancient city in Christ's day. It was founded by pirates in what became the land of the Phoenicians who were the great sailors and merchants of the ancient world. The city was built on a rocky island and was known as the Queen of the East. A lot like Venice would become in the West. Its citizens became wealthy from trade, much of it the slave trade. So it was a notorious region, clearly a land of unbelief, of, of hard hearts and paganism. But for that reason, it was a place where the Lord could retire for a while and rest with his disciples. That was his intent in traveling there, at least uh, ostensibly that was the reason he went there. According to verse 24, he wanted no one to know of it. They wanted privacy there in that region. But even there in that dark land, he was known. His reputation had preceded him and he could not escape notice. One person only responded, but she responded eagerly when the Lord's presence became known. It was a mother whose little daughter had an unclean spirit. And in verse 25, Mark writes that she responded immediately. She came to the house where Jesus was, entered, and fell at his feet. In verse 26, Mark describes her as a Gentile, literally a Greek of the Syrophoenician race. Matthew identifies her as a Canaanite woman. If we put all that together, it would seem she was a Greek by language, maybe by culture, and a Canaanite by race, Israel's historic enemy that had polluted the land of Canaan, the promised land, with the most depraved idolatry and immorality. And yet, this is the person who comes to Jesus and fell at his feet. Matthew records that before she did that, she called Jesus Lord and Son of David. What a contrast to what preceded. The scribes and the Pharisees were arguing with Jesus and secretly plotting his death while a Canaanite woman openly seeks him out and confesses he is the Messiah. You can't miss the contrast, and it, it demonstrates where real uncleanness lies. It is in the heart. It is a problem of human nature. That's what must be changed, not dirt on the hands. And the good news is that it can be changed in the most unlikely persons. A Gentile woman, a Canaanite of all people, a person outside the land and far from the light is enlightened. Now, what drew her to Jesus was a great need. She was a mother and her daughter, described as her little daughter, had a demon. And she kept asking him to cast it out. In Matthew, she said, my daughter is cruelly demon possessed. So this mother was desperate. She knew Jesus was master over the spirits and only he could heal her daughter. Isaiah said, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. And that is exactly what this woman was doing. He was near. She took advantage of that. She was calling upon him and calling upon him earnestly. 
She was just the kind of person the Lord responds to, the helpless and believing. When Jairus came to our Lord back in chapter 5, you remember he fell at his feet and pleaded for his daughter. And Jesus went off with him immediately. So we would expect the same response here. But that's not what happened. Mark wrote that she kept asking him to cast the demon out. She continually asked. And she continually asked because he didn't respond. That, that seems so uncharacteristic of Christ and on the face of it even cold. But it wasn't. He's never that, never indifferent to our cries for help. He was doing two things. First, he was making it clear that the mission to the Gentiles was still future. And secondly, he was, a, he was, he was showing how faith is strengthened. She wouldn't stop. She kept asking him. And so he finally answered her in verse 27, let the children be satisfied first, for it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Mark gave an abbreviated account of things. Matthew gave a fuller account. Jesus' response was first, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And what he was doing first was making his mission clear to her and to the disciples that he was the Jewish Messiah who had come for Israel. First and foremost, that's what he was. And he had to be obedient to his mission. The mission included the Gentiles and the, the door of salvation would be open to them in the near future. That was foreshadowed in his visit here to the region of Tyre and then later to Decapolis. But the time was not yet. The mission to Israel had not yet been fulfilled. The woman didn't object. She didn't say election is unfair, anything like that. She understood it as a matter of fact. She, she called Jesus son of David. But she was a mother and her child was suffering. So Matthew says, she says, Lord, help me. I think she was saying, in effect, this. I know I'm overstepping my bounds. And I know I'm not deserving of anything. I'm Syrophoenician. I'm a Canaanite. I'm not an Israelite. But please help me. She wasn't pleading for herself. She was asking, no doubt with tears in her eyes, for her little daughter. What parent can't appreciate that? So surely at this request, the Lord could not refuse her. But this was when Jesus said that it wasn't right to give the children's food to the dogs. The dogs are the Gentiles. The children are the Jews. So the Lord called her a dog. Not only did he not answer her, her emotional and reverential request, but he added insult to injury. Or so it seems, but not really. The Lord didn't use the word that referred to wild dogs or the, the scavengers that prowled city streets and were a nuisance really a danger to people. He used a word that means little dogs. Uh, they, these were the harmless dogs that people might even keep as household pets. The, the tone of his response isn't given. You can't really communicate that in the written word. But knowing his character and also knowing what follows in the account, we can assume that he spoke to her with kindness uh, maybe even with a smile, that's been suggested. 
it's, it's clear from her response that she wasn't put off by his statement. She wasn't put off by his response to her. In fact, she was emboldened because she didn't leave and stop. She continued. She came back with a, a clever answer and an insightful answer. It, it was an answer of faith. She agreed. Yes, Lord. Everything you're saying is true. Yes, Lord. And she's calling him Lord. But even the dogs under the table feed on the children's crumbs. There are three things to notice in this response. First, her humility. There's no sense of entitlement in what she says. She didn't impose herself on Christ as though she had a right to his help. Yes, Lord, she said. She, she accepted the Lord's comparison of her with the dog. She, she was a Gentile. She was outside the covenant blessings that belonged to Israel. She knew that. And he was still the Lord. He's not diminished in her thinking at all. He's still the master. She knew he had no claim, she had no claim on him, but she also knew that he was gracious. She knew that he was kind, and it was in his nature to respond to her. It was in his nature to help and not refuse the needy. Even good masters let, the, let some crumbs fall under the table for their pet dogs, she was saying. And she knew Jesus was a good master. He couldn't neglect her. And that's the second point. She knew. She had faith. She looked to him and to him alone for help, the very help she needed. He was the one and the only one that can do that. She knew that. She was powerless and he was powerful. She believed that with confident faith. So she persevered. And that's the third thing that we see in this woman. Enduring, continuing, persevering faith. No, we're not the children, Lord, but can't we have just some of the crumbs of your mercy? And that pleased the Lord. Verse 29, and he said to her, because of this answer, go. The demon has gone out of your daughter. In Matthew, the Lord added, O oh, woman, your faith is great. And when she went back home, she found her child lying on the bed with the demon having left. Now well, that was a happy ending and one that we expected. But why did it take so long to happen? What was the Lord doing in all of this? Why didn't he simply uh, grant her request? It was a valid request, and it does seem urgent. Well, there are two answers, two reasons. First, as said earlier, he was making clear to her, a Greek, a Canaanite, actually, that his mission was, first of all, to the Jews. He indicated that strongly, but with... Uh, without rejecting her or sending her away so that she could continue asking for his help. And, and that too was the reason. By prolonging his response, he tested her faith. He was providing her with resistance in order to strengthen her faith as well as instruct the disciples on that very point. They're watching this, they're observing, they're learning, hopefully, from what is taking place. But this is how faith is forced to grow and become firm. It's like anything. It's like a physical exercise. It, you, you don't develop strength in your limbs without resistance, without being forced to, to press against it and do so repeatedly. And that's what's occurring here. The answer she sought 
was not given immediately, and that forced the woman to exercise her faith, to, to press on in faith. False faith gives up. Genuine faith perseveres. And in persevering, it becomes more durable as a result. This is often the way the Lord deals with His people. We see this in a, in a number of places. It's the way that He dealt with Abraham. At the very beginning, when God called Abraham, who at that time was known as Abram, exalted father, out of Ur of the Chaldeans, he promised him that he would be a father, that he would be an exalted father, that he would have seed, he would have descendants. I will make you a great nation, he said. Later, it was a multitude of nations. So as you read on, the, the, the promise even expands and becomes even greater. He repeated that promise throughout the early chapters of Genesis. Over and over we hear this great promise that was given to him. He would make his descendants like the dust of the earth, the stars of the heavens, innumerable. But all during that time, as you know, Abram, exalted father, had no children. He was childless. Now he had Ishmael by Hagar, the slave woman, but they were disqualified. Abraham thought, well, this is the fulfillment, but it wasn't. No, the son that he promised would come through Sarah. Only when he was in extreme old age, when he was beyond having children, and all hope, humanly, was, was gone, only then was the promise fulfilled. 25 years after it was originally given. And Abraham became known as the father of all who believe. His faith was strong. His faith is exemplary. It was developed. It began in the darkness of Ur by the grace of God. And it was challenged all along the way for 25 years. And it grew stronger and stronger. That's how his faith was made to grow through waiting and testing and seeing God faithful. Uh, the, second, the same second example I could give is, a, is the same kind of example with Isaac. Rebecca was barren. Genesis 25 verse 21 states, Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife. And he continued praying. A period of 20 years elapses before they have their children, the twins, Jacob and Esau. But for 20 years he prayed for his wife. That was the result, the birth of those twins, the result of persevering faith in prayer. There are other examples. Hannah longing for a son and praying for one until she had Samuel. You see that in 1 Samuel chapter 1. Are you praying and not getting the answer that you're seeking? I know you are. This is a common experience of us. Don't stop. Don't stop. God doesn't work on our schedule. He withholds His answer to our prayer until it is the right time. And He does that for our good. And He does that to strengthen our faith. And the answer that He gives and that He will give is always the right one and the best one. Because as we'll see at the end of this chapter, He does all things well. All things. Now He'll strengthen our faith through the period of waiting and the challenge that He gives to us. And the result will be a stronger faith. That's the reason for this. So he answered this prayer and this great need, and then we read that he traveled on to another location, on to the, through, to the Phoenician town of Sidon, then southeast along the northern rim of the Sea of Galilee, and into the region of Decapolis on the east bank of the Sea of Galilee. Decapolis means ten cities. The Greeks had occupied it for nearly 200 years. The Romans governed it. So again, this is, this is largely Gentile territory with some Jewish settlements there, but 
Generally, this is a Gentile region. He has, he has traveled from a region of Canaanites to a region of Greeks and Romans. So again, he was among the Gentiles. He was among the dogs. He had been there earlier. You remember that in uh, chapter 5, the maniac possessed by a legion of demons was from this area. When Jesus healed him, he sent him back home to tell of the mercy that Jesus had on him. And Mark wrote, he went away and began to proclaim in Decapolis what great things Jesus had done for him. And everyone was amazed. He'd done a good job. He'd been a good evangelist. He'd been obedient to what the Lord said because when the Lord arrived, word got out that this one who had done this amazing miracle and delivered this man from thousands of demons was back in that area. And a crowd came out and a crowd gathered around him. They brought a man to him who was deaf and spoke with difficulty. And knowing that the Lord was merciful, they were begging Jesus to lay his hand on him. The Lord's response was different from his response to the Syrophoenician woman. He healed her daughter from a distance without a touch. So obviously it wasn't necessary that he touch the person he healed. But here he does. Here it's very hands-on. He took the man aside by himself put his fingers into his ears, and after spitting, he touched his tongue with the saliva. Now that all seems a bit strange, doesn't it? Why all of that? Well, not out of necessity, not because these are, are, are means of healing, but for instruction. Saliva may have been used because it is necessary for speech and by placing his on the man's tongue he was showing that, that he, the Lord, is the source of man's speech. He gives us the words. He gives us the ability to do what we do. So he's the source of that healing. But also by putting his fingers in the man's ears he was showing that he is the one who gives hearing. Gives ears to hear. That's a miracle. He, he, he opens them. All of this what was done to help the man's faith. Remember, he's deaf. He can't hear the commands that he's given to believe. He can't hear instruction. And he was mute. He couldn't confess faith. He was helpless. And so Jesus used what the man could see and what the man could feel to communicate to him and in that way to awaken his faith, as well as to illustrate these very important points and impress this upon the man that where he is unable, the Lord is completely able. Again, the Lord dealt with the deaf differently from the way he dealt with the daughter. But we're all different. So he brings us to faith and to himself in different ways, ways that we need. There's not one way in which we come to the Lord. People come to the Lord in a variety of ways. There's only one way to salvation, but there are many ways to that one way. Many different backgrounds, many different experiences. And the Lord knows them all and He uses different means to bring us according to our unique condition and unique place. And this is what He does, we see in both of these examples and others. Then we read, looking up, with a deep sigh, he said to him, Ephatha, that is, be opened. And the man's ears were opened and his tongue was loosed. And this is the only place in the Gospels where this miracle is recorded. And what emotion the Lord showed in doing it. He commanded hearing after a deep sigh. Why the deep sigh? Well, it was a very human response to misery and suffering. In fact, 
the, the closer we are to the Lord and the more we share his mind, the, the more sensitive we are to human tragedy. And none can be more sensitive to human tragedy and to the human condition than Jesus. He was the man of sorrows. So weighed down with this man's affliction and the suffering of this fallen world that it's, it, it stirred his emotions deeply. Just as his emotions were stirred before the tomb of Lazarus. You remember Jesus wept. I think he wept for a number of reasons. He wept because of the pain and the sorrow that Lazarus' sisters and friends were feeling. But it, it was a, an example the death of his friend, of the misery that sin had brought on men, and he wept over that. And here we see his response of deep emotion. He gave out a deep sigh because of the tragedy that has come upon the human race due to sin. He sympathized with that man just as he sympathizes with us when we go through trials. And we're told that in the book of Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15, that we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness. No, he can. He's been tempted in all things as we, and yet without sin. And that means two things. First of all, he, he's not guilty of any sin. He's pure. He's perfect. But that doesn't, that doesn't really separate him from our experience because he experienced the temptation to the full extent because he didn't fall out of it due to sin. He didn't cave in. He continued in perfection to the end experiencing temptation to its full intensity so he knows what we go through and he's sympathetic with us and all that we experience even with our failure. He has sympathy for us and he's one that we can turn to in those times and seek help. And so, as our priest, he prays for us individually with personal care. He prays intelligently. He prays compassionately, intensely concerned for, him, for, for us. He always, and this is important, he always prays effectively. He gets what he prays for us. We, we see that here. He looked up to heaven prayed the man's ears would be open. When they were opened, the impediment of his tongue was removed and he began speaking plainly. I don't know if that's an example of what Paul talks about in Ephesians 3, that he does exceeding abundantly beyond all that we ask or think. He prays for the ears and the tongue is loosed as well. Certainly it's true. Well, there's a, an obvious connection <clears throat> between hearing and speaking. We, we learn to speak correctly by listening to other people doing it. And this man had never learned to speak. He couldn't hear. And so we have this double miracle that occurs. He could hear and suddenly express his thoughts clearly. So there are two miracles that take place. He's able to speak now as well as hear. And he wants to speak. He can barely contain himself, but the Lord instructed the man and his friends not to tell others. Maybe, maybe the Lord wanted to continue to have some privacy, which he hadn't had yet, and had this time alone with the disciples. Or, or, or maybe he, he wanted to be known as more than a healer and not just known as a miracle worker, so don't speak about this, but they did anyway. This man who now can speak can't contain himself and he and his friends proclaimed the Lord's mercy widely and the result was people were utterly astonished and they said he has done all things well. What a great conclusion to both of these miracles and what a, what a great declaration of truth that is. He has done all things well. He always does all things well. Both parts of this passage complement each other and both give examples of prayer. One showing that we should pray for others and two 
showing how we should pray. And three, how the Lord answers. The woman prayed for her daughter continually, re repeatedly before receiving an answer, while the friends of the deaf man were answered immediately. So what it shows is God answers prayer in different ways. And we should understand that. We should not expect to have a, an, a, a prayer answered immediately, necessarily. It may take time. We may have a prayer answered immediately. It, what, it, what this tells us, though, is, is it is for us to pray. We're responsible to do that. We need to do that. We speak of the means of grace that God has given to us. This is one of the means of grace. Use it. He has ordained His blessings to come to us through prayer. And so we're to pray. He has ordained that His elect come to Him through evangelism. So we're to evangelize. So pray. That's the lesson we're given here. That's difficult. It's difficult to do when the, the answer doesn't come immediately. It tests our faith and patience. And patience is the fruit of faith. But persistent prayer is what the Lord blesses. We, we can't give friends or family spiritual insight. We'd like to. We can't do that. We can see the problem, but we can't fix it ourselves. We can't give them faith. We can't give them a desire for salvation. We can't open their eyes to the problem that they are in. But we can pray for conversion. And the Lord does. He saves. He answers those prayers. Those answers may come... 10 or 15 years later. It may not be until we're finally far away from this world that they come. But while we can, we should pray. In the end, we will all confess He has done all things well. That's one lesson of the passage. But this is also about the Lord's worldwide purpose in salvation. His journey to Tyre and mercy on a Canaanite woman foreshadowed that. Mark doesn't say that the, the deaf man was a Gentile, but he was from Decapolis, which is outside the land of the Jews, signifying further that the gospel would go to the land of the Gentiles. But here we have in both cases uh, the Lord's divine power being demonstrated and his work of salvation being illustrated, he delivers from the power of Satan. He gives ears to hear. He gives tongues to praise. He's the source of all of that. You and I are responsible to respond, but he is the one that causes it all to happen. Salvation is of the Lord. And it is for all kinds of people, the Jew and Gentile alike, but sometimes the Lord must bring people to the end of themselves before they will even seek Him. That's not always the case, but oftentimes that is the case. Would these two people have found Jesus without their afflictions and trials? Well, maybe. J Jesus said He is the one way to the Father, but there are many ways to Him, to Jesus. There are many ways to the one way. But clearly, from both passages, these did come to Christ because they had affliction and were desperate. That is what galvanized a response in them or in a mother for her daughter or friends for their friend. And that's what afflictions can do. We don't want affliction. We don't invite trials and difficulties. But it is sometimes God's means to awaken a sinner to his or her need or correct a saint in his or her folly. God uses affliction in that way. That, that was the confession of the psalmist in Psalm 119 and verse 71. It was good for me that I was afflicted that I may learn your statutes. And all of this is to say, again, that the Lord does all things well. 
And when all of this is finished, and we are all in his presence, when he wipes away every tear from our eyes, we will confess that. That statement, I think, is a beacon for our faith, something that we need to keep uh, focused in our mind. Because when at times of affliction or disappointment, we can't quite see it, we can know it. We may not be able to fully appreciate it because of the difficulty that we are in, but this is the truth and this is what we lay hold of. He's revealed it to be true. He does all things well. And the Lord's journey here from his country into the dark regions of the world where he allowed himself to be found in, as we see in this passage, is uh, but a glimpse of what he would do and is doing as he sends out his people into the dark regions of the world to bring the good news of him and his salvation. That's pictured here, and that's the encouragement we have God's purpose is to save the lost from all over the world. Christ is the Savior of the world. He saves all who believe in Him. Have you believed in Him? If not, look to Christ. He receives all who do. As Isaiah said, seek the Lord while He may be found. Call upon Him while He is near. He's near as the word is preached. Respond. And you who have, rejoice He does all things well, and He will continue to do them in your life. Trust in Him and wait upon Him. God, help us all to do that. Let's pray. Father, we do thank You for Your goodness to us, and we can make this confession about Your Son, about our triune God. Everything that's done is done well and it's done perfectly. Sometimes we have to learn that in difficult times, but it's true, always true. We give you thanks for being so good and gracious to us, for bringing us into your family and blessing us and giving us a glorious future. That's all in Christ, and it's in his name we pray. Amen.